here this morning with uh, Professor John Zimmerman, Professor of History and Education and Department Chair at NYU. Um, he is a prolific author, uh, a number of books, uh, most recently Small Wonder, Little Red Schoolhouse in History and Memory, and actually a just about to arrive in the bookstore's uh, new book uh, on the history of sex education. Is that the right way to frame that book? Yes. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I mean, uh, it won't be out till March, but uh, it does have a good title. I mean, which is too hot to handle. There, there you go. Oh, I like. There we go. And the cover yeah. seems to be pretty uh, engaging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I should also note that, in addition to, to many other things that people will read, we'll link to your bio from this uh, um, uh, on the page here, uh, uh, in terms of, of various publications and your former position as president of History of Ed Society and so forth. Um, but also that you're somebody who is engaged uh, actively in the public uh, sphere in terms of uh, op-ed pieces and editorials and a spot on John Stewart. I mean, there is just no limit uh, uh, to the to that. And uh, so, uh, very notable, I think, presence um, beyond the worlds of history uh, to to the wider uh, public conversation. And for that, we're we're pleased and particularly pleased to to have a chance to chat um, here. Um, as you know, this series is really to, to try to take the, uh, the kind of thinking that you've had and reading that you've had over the years and trying to get a historical perspective on, on schools and school reform and education reform more generally, um, and to try to translate some of that to a wider public that may not yet be familiar with your work. Um, and so I'm wondering what would you, what you might start out with by, by helping us out. If you had some headlines to provide to folks who don't uh, haven't yet enjoyed uh, uh, kind of reading in the history of education, what would be the kinds of things that would be headlines for you to, to, to let them know about? And, and when you say headlines, Mike, are you saying just headlines generically about the historical dimensions of education or headlines from my own work? Um, well, I think either way you want to go. I mean, I think that the challenge here is to say um, if we had a historical perspective, we're in the midst of all sorts of, of competing waves around school reform and what we ought to do for in education, and particularly in the U.S., and um, if we had a larger perspective on it, what might be the kinds of things we would want to keep in okay. mind? Um, you, you've written, obviously, on a wide range of subjects uh, from our yeah. book, uh, uh, and, and I know some are dear to your heart, but I just want to give you an open-ended uh, start. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I would, tell you, I would say two things. I would say that um, uh, the first thing that I would want people to realize is that the United States was a pioneer in mass education. Um, uh, that is, by 1850, we educated a larger fraction of our kids for at least part of the time than any nation in recorded human history. Um, uh, almost all of them were white, of course, and it was distributed unequally like it always has been, but nevertheless, Education became a mass institution here at the primary level in, in the mid-1900s, in the mid and then at the secondary level for the first time, starting in the Great Depression. Um, the United States was way ahead of the curve on those things. Um, uh, and um, uh, I think there are, a couple, there are a couple really important things to realize about that. I think that um, I, we've always disagreed about what education should do. But there's also been an interesting consensus about the value of education writ large. So if you compare the United States to countries in Europe, especially the United Kingdom, what you find is that in the UK, the Whigs and Tories argued for several centuries about whether poor people should go to school. Um, uh, you know, the Tory view was, why should a future mill worker go to school? That's not really going to do very much. In fact, it could do harm. Right. for the stability of the society. And the United States never had that argument. Um, uh, uh, we didn't have an argument that, 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 that everyone, quote, unquote, should have the opportunity to go to school. Not this boy for girls. Another argument we did not have was whether girls, now we're talking at the primary level, should go to school. Um, obviously, there are arguments about what they should do in school and what they should do after school. But the consensus on universal primary education in the 19th century included girls' education, which again, um, are quite radical and quite different from many other societies. So I think that that's something really to celebrate about our history, but also we have to grapple with uh, 
some of, let's just say, what, what the economists would call unintended consequences. And for me, I would say the most important one is that this had a hugely adverse effect on the social standing of teachers. Um, because if you're going to suddenly, which we did, educate millions of kids um, who had never been through the door of a school before, um, what you're going to do almost by definition is hire teachers that have only slightly more education than the kids in their charge. And that's precisely what we did. They were young women between the ages of 16 and 20, and they had almost no formal education. And um, uh, I think that what that did was it began a pattern that's continuing to this day, which is um, the extremely low status of teachers, um, especially compared to other societies, which ironically husbanded or distributed education less. And those societies teach at a higher status, which makes sense. But part of my work has involved Africa recently because I've been teaching and studying there for the past couple of years. And if you look at the histories of countries like Ghana, where I've been teaching, you find a really interesting repetition of this pattern. So in the 1960s, after independence, countries like Ghana declare universal primary education. And this is a terrific thing. But you don't get it by snapping your fingers. Um, somebody is going to have to teach the kids who are suddenly streaming into these new schools. And in Ghana in the 60s, just like in the United States in the 1850s, it's so-called student teachers, that's what they called them in the 60s, um, who were basically teenagers who had been to some school, often very little. Um, uh, and this, too, had a tremendously adverse effect on the teaching profession in Ghana, which has continued to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fascinating. Um, but I, I, so I think it's particularly interesting this consensus value. And I was wondering if you might talk a little bit more about this sort of this value of education, uh, which uh, historically is not something necessarily that was associated with the U.S., if you will, as a as a as a. Yeah, uh, sorry, Mike, you just went out for that question. Right, okay. you'll have to see that. So the the uh, the the image of the U.S. is not terribly a, a, a well-lettered society for a long period of time. Um, and, um, and yet you talk about this, this consensus around the value of education being early. I'm wondering if you can reconcile that for us historically a little bit. Well, you know, well-lettered, well I mean, it, it, you know, we didn't have, um, uh, you know, a tremendous record in the production of what today would be called classical literature. But... By the time of the revolution, we also have an astonishingly high rate of literacy and numeracy. Those things are difficult to measure, but again, the people who have tried to do that via you know, signatures on documents and things like that show that um, uh, Americans were, if not you know, well-lettered in the, in the bell letter sense, um, uh, they were extremely literate compared to many other parts of the world at the time. And, and um, I would say the consensus on education in part springs from the fact that I mentioned earlier, that everyone wants something different from it. So just because we have a consensus on the value of education doesn't mean we have a consensus on what it should do, quite to the contrary. And that's the other irony here. I would say, in, in part, these are related. The consensus on education comes because so many people want it for different reasons. Um, so there's no question, like the, like the dearly departed Michael Katz wrote many years ago, that some people want education because they're quite worried about the, um, the disorder and the radical tendencies that this new working class seems to represent and portend. And you can see this even in the rhetoric of people like Horace Mann, you know, like, unless we school these people, they're going to turn to some kind of radical alternative and they're going to destabilize our society. Um, but if you look at the working class itself, again, unlike many other societies, you see a huge commitment to education, not because they think, obviously, you know, this is how the man is going to control us. You know, people rarely support somebody for that reason, right? But because they think that it's going to help them achieve a kind of social mobility. Now, that's not to say it does, right? Because often we have scant record of that. We're talking about ideology here and belief. And even quite radical parties like the working man's movements of the Horace Mann era, they're four square behind schools, um, uh, precisely because they think that what schools are going to do is give them a leg up in a society that was becoming highly unequal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part of the, the, the challenge around the purposes, it seems, arises around a theme that you've talked about a lot as well, written a lot about it, in terms of uh, who controls the, the, the substance of what happens at schooling, uh, who controls curriculum. Uh, 
uh, what is that about, particularly as we get to more controversial issues around uh, that, that, that uh, involve identity or, or uh, moral behavior and so forth. And I'm just wondering right. if, that, if you might help us understand that seems to be an ongoing battle, certainly, about yeah. what ought to well, be. That's probably, <laughs> I, I've written about a lot of different things, but the question you're raising is probably the, the most common theme in my own work. Um, which has to do with not the way that schools operate because people like yourself and others have, have uh, cornered that market. Um, what, what I've studied mostly is what people outside of schools want schools to do. And a lot of my work has turned on a contradiction, um, which I think runs through our history, which goes like this. Many of us, including myself, have insisted that education is absolutely critical to democracy. Um, that in fact, just like Jefferson said, you can't have newspapers, uh, uh, you can't have democracy without newspapers. Um, I, I also think you can't have democracy, not a working one, without schools. Um, because people aren't born with the skills and habits of little Democrats. They don't come out of the womb saying, well, I'm going to inform myself about civic issues and then I'm going to, you know, deliberate them in a reasonable fashion and respect people that I disagree with. Well, you know, all of those are learned behaviors um, and somebody's got to teach them and schools are our primary public institution for doing so, for fostering um, the skills and habits of democracy. But here's where the interesting contradiction comes in that I think most people, including John Dewey, who wrote about this subject, never really address, which is that what if it turns out that the demos, i.e. the people in the word democracy, don't want a school system that is dedicated to the skills that Dewey identified as central to democracy? Um, so, you know, going back before Dewey to Jefferson. You find people saying, you know, what we need schools to do is teach us how to critically analyze and how to judge for ourselves, how to reason, um, how to deliberate. Um, uh, I, but what if it turns out the public doesn't want schools for that reason? What if it turns out the demos want schools so kids will learn to obey adults or maybe so they'll learn, you know, vocational skills? You know, if you went up to somebody on Broadway or in Philly on Broad Street and you said, what do you want your kids' schools to do? Or actually, a better question would be, do you want schools to teach your kid to question everything, including everything you've taught your kid? I think most people would say, hell no. You know, I'd like school to teach my kid skills that will work in the marketplace, right? And also, I'd like schools to teach my kid, like, to get up at the right time. Get themselves dressed and ready for school at the right time, and to follow a certain set of rules to be for them in their lives. Um, so, you know, um, I, I, what do you do when the Zimmermans and the Johannics of the world say that we need schools in order to teach more than anything else a kind of critical awareness and skill that's central to democracy? And the demos itself doesn't necessarily want schools for that reason. You know, where, where's the interest group in our current political landscape called people for debating the other side in schools? Right. right. Um, uh, you know, I, I, don't think, I, I don't think that it, it exists. Um, uh, and Dewey came close to addressing this question only once in a paper that I've quoted, um, which is called something like, are the schools doing what the public want them to do? And Dewey answers the question by saying they're not. And they won't until the school educates the public about what it wants, mm -hmm. which is a really interesting answer. And I think very much of a tell, like the card players would say. I think that for people like Dewey, the school played a role sort of like revolution does in a Marxian framework. It's the, it's the good thing you need for all the other good things. Mm -hmm. And is there, but is, how there, can, is there a <coughs> sense there, too? I mean, it always seemed to me that one of the parts of, that, were, that was present in other Never dominant, certainly, but uh, uh, more prevalent perhaps in, in prior discussions around schooling had to do with public education's role in educating the public about education. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm wondering oh, if that, that seems to have gotten, uh, seems to be more absent. Maybe that's, you know, we've more, uh, maybe Labrie's right, we've just all gotten into uh, uh, social mobility and individual goals. It's a private consumption. And so, or is there something else going on there? I mean, how would you 
Well, actually, I mean, look, that theme, at least at the, at the, at the level of rhetoric, still runs through all of our discussions. I mean, look at the charter question, the charter movement. I mean, so much of the charter school movement is premised on educating the public. And the charter school people will admit that, right? Unless the public both knows about the choices that are available and has the skills and tools to choose between their choices, choice is meaningless, right? Um, the system, however we're defining it, must educate the public about these options for the option to be meaningful. But the, but the charters are arguing for the need for charters. I'm thinking actually also, I think that's a great example, so I think the homeschoolers actually also do some of that role. I mean, sort of in questioning right. what the role of this institution is meant to be vis-a-vis -vis family interests and other things. But, but the right. idea that, that the charters are there to educate, uh, that part of their role is to educate the public about the need for, if you will, civic development through this institution called charters, seems low on their advertising list. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, 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 they do acknowledge the need to educate about the range of choices available because anyone who takes choice seriously understands that it's not a serious thing unless people have information, unless they know what the choices are. Right, right. And I guess there are notable exceptions, democracy prep and a few others that I think have made that more of a mainstay, but... So yeah. this relates to me as well to another question, which is uh, the competing um, uh, sort of value systems that, that folks may want schools to assist in. Uh, the U.S. is uh, particularly active as a, uh, religiously relative to, or at least has been historically to other, uh, to other countries it's been compared to. Um, and, and so we have this institution that's meant to raise my child and I'm a good Southern Baptist, and the the school is is talking about things that I don't I don't buy into. So now it's not just um, you know maybe neglecting something; it's actually countering something that that I think is important. Uh, how, how do we understand that, and how do we resolve that? Is there any is there any exit to this this kind of conflict, or how does that? Well, I think, I think there isn't any exit, and there are a couple reasons for that. I think, first of all, you know, another huge historical theme in the United States is local control. You know? um, so the pattern of development in the United States to be as crude as possible after white people got here was generally move to a place, evict or kill, alas, the human beings that were there, and then elect a school board. You know? Um, and, and let's remember that schools were vastly more local in the past than they are now. I mean, we now have 40,000 school districts, and, you know, you compare that to countries that have one, and you say, oi, right, this is incredibly local, but you have to understand that there were like 200,000 of them. So believe it or not, today, the American school system, which seems so decentralized compared to other democracies, is r remarkably centralized compared to what it was, right? Um, so, you know... Um, in, in big American cities, every neighborhood had its own school board. And by the way, the teachers were like the nieces of the people on the school board, right? And then they, they created central school boards, right? And then the countryside, of course, every little town, every in, little district, really, every tiny settlement, Hamlet has school board. And then you see some centralization there, so-called union districts. Um, but again, compared to France, where I taught a few years ago, where there is one school district, it's remarkably decentralized. So, you know, my, my students in France were all going to be teachers. And once they finished, they applied to the Bureau de l'Ensemble, like, you know, the Bureau of Teaching, right? right? And, you know, maybe if you're lucky, you get placed in Paris or maybe you get placed in, you know, Normandy or Nice or whatever, right? That's not the way we do things here. And to go back to your question, I don't think we can understand the way that we disagree and the way that citizens have put a really, really huge... Um, accent on schooling unless we think about how local it's been because that provides citizens with an incredibly direct voice in the way that schools work. You know, I just finished a book on the history of sex ed around the world and I did a lot of work in Sweden um, which turns out to be the first nation to require sex ed and they're very proud of this fact over there. And um, one of the things that I find so interesting is in the 60s and 70s a lot of um, left-leaning Americans go to Sweden to kind of learn how the master does it, you know. And one of the things that they report is, you know, they, they tell the Swedes, well, listen, this would never fly in our school district because a bunch of parents would complain. And the Swedes are like, 
Who cares? Like, why should that matter? And of course, this is a fascinating discussion because it wasn't about sex or sex ed at all, right? I mean, it was about school governance, right? And in Sweden, you know, it's like tough noogies. You know, you don't like the sex ed curriculum? Well, maybe you don't like the calculus curriculum. You know, maybe you don't like school at all. Like, who the F are you? You know, and why should, why should we listen to you anyway? You know, um, and again, you know, in America, you've got it. Um, and you have to because the schools are intimately and irreducibly tied to locality. Um, and I would argue that that's a hugely important historical le legacy, which like all of our legacies, has incredibly salutary and incredibly problematic consequences, both. You know, on the salutary side, one of the things we've discovered, thanks to the economic historians, going back to the era of Horace Mann, is that the closer you are in directly influencing your school, the more likely you are to pay for it. Um, and they, you know, they've gone back and they've shown this even in the 1820s and 1830s. So the smaller the school district and the greater the fractional influence, if you will, of each citizen on the election of the school board and the conduct of the school, the more likely people are to ante up. You know, so if you're one of these liberals like me that's constantly complaining about the fact that Americans defund or don't fund their schools, it's a little hard also to bitch about local control. When we have lots of strong evidence showing that local control is actually the best predictor of funding your schools or high funding of schools. On the other hand, if you want a very vivid and dramatic display of, let's just say, the less than salutary consequences of local, local control, have a look at those greeny black and white films of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas, circa 1957. And you'll see local control in its most vicious and racist dimensions. What are those mobs screaming as those nine black kids try to go in? They're not just screaming all this awful, you know, racial vituperation, although they were. They're screaming local control, right? That was their banner. You know, we run these schools. Who are you, Dwight Eisenhower? Who are you, Supreme Court? Who are you, 101st Airborne, to tell us how to operate our schools? We got local control here. Um, uh, and so, the same institution, local control, which has been so critical in solidifying American support for education in every sense, including financial, has also been a tool and a weapon that Americans have used to literally and figuratively wall themselves off from others, um, uh, wash their hands for responsibility towards their fellow Americans, and discriminate <laughs> on racial grounds and a million others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, a fantastic summary. Tell me... So this, this seems to raise, in, in a particularly interesting light, the current pressures around um, holding schools accountable uh, for the current rhetoric, that we're going to have, uh, uh, you know, hold them accountable now for their performance, with all the ambiguities you've introduced over the last several minutes. Um, how do you understand that? Where do you place that historically relative to either governance, local control, sure. curriculum, and so forth? Well, here's why I place it historically. I actually yeah, have a piece in the next book of books, actually, but you can probably read out more because they asked me to review a bunch of these books about teaching and that have just come out. And um, incidentally, if, 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 if nothing else, the current wave of education reform has, has, has spawned a, a, a really good group of journalists who write about education. And it's made education sexy, which is great for me, you know, and it's one of the points I try to make there. But... More specifically, with respect to your question, the way I think about this historically is a couple things. First of all, um, we're still too close to these accountability regimes historically in some ways to appreciate how radical they are. And when I say radical, I mean with a small r, not radical like, whoa, rad, dude. Just in a dictionary sense, a departure from the past, right? I mean, if at any point in our past, you would say, okay, listen, it's going to require all, all four thousand school districts to test everybody three times and then they require them to, you know, attach all sorts of sanctions, positive and negative, to the outcome of these tests. You would just say, no, you know, that's not the American way, that's the French way, you know, and let's, let's add a great political irony that, that the No Child Left Behind was presided over literally and figuratively by the Republican Party, the same party who under its still its current icon, Ronald Reagan, said there shouldn't be a Department of Education at all. <laughs> 
right? Because the Fed shouldn't be in this business, okay? So I think point number one is that it's a radical departure from the way we've done business in the past. Um, uh, uh, that's point number one. Point number two, these accountability regimes, despite how people like me have criticized them, have by and large been popular. And now we go back to the demos. By and large, it's a mix and it's changing. But if you look at No Child Left Behind, you know, it passed in 2001 and um, started, instituted in 2002. Some of my colleagues at the Ed School, they talk about No Child Left Behind like it was imposed in a Guatemalan military coup. You know, No Child Left Behind passed the U.S. Congress by like four, like 390 to 50, something like that, right? I mean, just a landslide, an avalanche, right? And its sponsors, you know, included Edward Kennedy. It included, you know, George Miller from the East Bay, by some measures, the most left-leaning member of the United States Congress. Um, none of this makes it good or wise, but it does make it popular and small d democratic. Then the third thing I would, I would think about historically is how in many ways this new accent on accountability, especially as measured via standardized tests, I think represents an attenuation or in some cases even an obliteration of the civic purposes that we have historically um, uh, asked schools to perform. So, you know, you read the letters of Horace Mann and he says, listen, this isn't just about the ABCs. And in fact, he's got this great line about it where he says, the ABCs have no spirit attached to them. You know, um, he wasn't against teaching the ABCs. You've got to know the ABCs to learn to read and write. But, um, you know, he thought that schools had what he called a spirit purpose, what we would call a civic purpose, you know, to bind us together. And I think these accountability regimes, I think really what they do is they put this hyper focus on the academic side of school. Right. There's no test to see if you're going to be a good citizen or if you're going to vote or pay your taxes. You know, the test to see if you can, you know, identify the three causes of the Civil War and, you know, do a compound fraction, right? So, in a way, what it is, is, is the triumph of the academic goals over everything else. But here's the great irony that I try to point out in my New York Review of Books article. Because of the way that these academic goals are taught and especially measured, um, I would argue that they have a tremendously, ironically, in the guise of trying to promote academics, in a way they diminish that too. What serious scholar would want to work in an environment where scholarship is taught and judged in the way that we're judging it? So ostensibly, and, and in terms of our rhetoric, we're prizing these academic goals over all the other ones. And look, that... That's a defensible thing, and our schools are woefully underperforming in the academic zone, and that's for sure. And, um, but the way we've gone about trying to enhance these academic goals may actually be diminishing them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but also, let me be clear, as critical as I am in this article of a lot of these accountability regimes, um, we do have to grapple with the fact that they were popular and they responded to to a set of conditions. If our schools had not been woeful at the time that these regimes were instituted, they wouldn't have passed. That's why the people wanted them. If, like Diane Ravitch, you want to argue that the cure has been worse than the disease, in some places I'll be with you. I think it has been. But it will behoove none of us to pretend that then if we take away the cure, we're not going to have more disease. Mm -hmm. Right? The cure might have been a bad response to a disease, but the disease was there, and that's why the cure passed. Mm -hmm. That's why it was po that's that's why it was popular and possible, is that our schools were woefully underperforming, and so I just think it's a fantasy fantasy to say if we just strip away these regimes and go back to the good old days, which by the way sucked. All right, that everything will be okay. Um, it won't be. Mm -hmm. And do you think part of that is, is this, this tendency over time, though? I mean, did people think that this was, since people have traditionally rated their local schools, to go back to your local point, uh, uh, much higher than they do schools generally, uh, was there a degree to which this was understood as a, as a cure for other people's schools? We're talking about No Child Left Behind here? Mm -hmm. um, well, 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 look, I... Um, you know, Mike, you went, you went in and out there. Could you repeat that question? Because well, I, I had one of those mic freezes just there. Sure, sure. 
So uh, it's, it's intrigued me about the, because I think you're absolutely right on, on No Child Left Behind and, and the popularity of it uh, in terms of people being, and, and I think it, it's part of other wider uh, cultural themes, it seems to me, in terms of how we're understanding organizations and holding them to performance metrics and all sorts of things. But there's this other interesting element in there that I'm just wondering how you understand of the, where we very often when you ask people uh, to say grade schools, they will grade them overall fairly low. And you ask them about their local school, and everyone really likes their local school, and it's yes. B plus or above. And I'm wondering, is that, right. you know, is no child left behind in some sense resumed as the remedy for other kid, other people's schools rather than our own? Yeah, look, I think all of this, again, is a legacy of the institution of local control, right? You can't understand the kind of paradox that you're describing without thinking historically about the the way that schools have been tied to community. Um, so, again, people will say, yeah, the schools are terrible. Um, uh, but but um, even in schools that by every metric we have are woefully underperforming, they'll say, but, you know, my school's all right. Right? And the reason is, like, my aunt went there, you know, or even I went there, right? And it's, it, it's not just tied to community. It's an embodiment of community. It's our chief public symbol and even totem of community. So if you start saying that your school sucks, it's kind of like saying that you suck and your community does. And it turns out that most human beings are not disposed to admitting that. You know, um, we rather don't like to do that. We like to think that we're fairly awesome. Right? You know, even if, even if the people down the road, wow, well, you go down to that school, that's no good at all. Right. But but, you know, ours is OK. And, you know, this is why I mean, one of the great paradoxes of recent history that I find fascinating is that, you know, in, in cities like New York and others, when people like Joel Klein have moved to closed schools, which by every way we've been able to figure out are terrible. Right. Klein wasn't wrong when he said that a lot of these schools he wanted to close by every way we could measure were awful. He was right. But see, there's this thing you can't measure. Right, which is the sentiment and the bonds that tie people to their local school, and that's what Klein didn't factor in. You know that even if, by every way we can measure, a school isn't teaching people to read and write very well, the people who live in that neighborhood are still going to be bound to it. That's really the prime legacy of local control. And again, look, I think it. Like I was saying earlier, it's. Salutary and non-salutary, you know, I mean, there's, there's, I, I, I think, I, I understand why people want to hold on to their local schools, but if the school isn't teaching their kids to read and write very well, that's a big problem, not just for that neighborhood, but for all of us. All of us have or should have skin in this game, and we should all be alarmed at the prospect of holding on to a school in its current configuration if the school is not teaching kids to read and write. Mm -hmm. And what I think is interesting, this is my own editorial, I suppose, but I think it's interesting the way you've lined it up because the, the rising emphasis on the academic purposes has been justified in many ways through an, uh, an economic logic, which, again, despite some of what economists have helped us understand, is a fairly loose set of links between, uh, but arguably at least more so today, linkage between certain academic skills and economy. But the performance of civic uh, or spirit uh, and its outcome, right. it seems to me, is a, is a more absent argument um, that we just don't hold. Uh, right, right. right. And, and, and right. But, but again, there's no test for that. Right, right, right. 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 And the irony is it's, yeah, it's precisely what we don't test, right, these kind of civic sentiments in some ways have been the great, whatever word you want to use, inhibitor, obstacle, block on the accountability regime. That's what I think is so ironic here, right, is these kind of civic sentiments that in this case tie people to their schools are precisely what the Joel Kleins of the world didn't calculate. They don't measure them, but also in the political realm, they discounted them. You know, they tried to imagine them away. You know, oh, who's going to want to hold on to a school that's so terrible? You know what? A lot of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I always think uh, back, I think back I, to it. And again, that might be good or bad. I'm, not I'm trying to understand it. You know, 
Um, and I think that they really miss Glinda. Excellent. Well, you've been you've been very generous with your time, so, John. Uh, 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 so I want to give you one last moment to any other any other thoughts you might want to share, uh, ways that uh, might help uh, people get uh, some historical perspective on on especially current efforts on school reform. Is there anything else you'd want to throw in? Well, I guess, you know, I guess, I guess people think I'd add is that um, there's also a great contradiction, which I try to point out in this New York Review piece. Can you hear me? You're freezing. Hello? Yes, I can. Oh, okay. Are you back now? Yeah, you froze again. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay, good. The only thing I'd add, and I try to point this out in the, in the piece that's coming out next week, is there's also this huge and tragic contradiction between the at least ostensible rhetorical emphasis on academic skills right now and the woeful state of and preparation of our teaching profession. So on the one hand, we're saying academics above all, right? And um, on the other, we have a teaching profession where since the 1960s, in every successive decade, the fraction of top students that have gone into teaching has declined, and it's a line, right? It's really a downward slope, right? Um, uh, we, we can find different explanations for that and uh, different or arguments about how to remedy it, but you can't deny it, you know. And here's the great irony. On the one hand, we're emphasizing schools as a vehicle of academic skills, but I try to argue that the way we think about it, and especially the way we prepare teachers, we don't regard them as, as, as academics or intellectuals. So on the one hand, schools should be preparing everybody academically because academic goals are primary and prime and everything, right? They're everything, right? But on the other hand, we prepare teachers in a way that doesn't respect their intellects. You know, um, uh, it turns out that how to teach, quote, simple mathematics is not simple. It's extraordinarily complicated. And to do well requires an extraordinary level of theoretical and intellectual ability, uh, theoretical knowledge and intellectual ability. Um, by and large, our teachers don't get it, you know. Here's the best way to teach algebra. Here's the best practice, right? That's an insult to teachers' intellect, you know? So on the one hand, we're saying schools should be inscribing all these academic goals, all right, and privileging, privileging them above everything else. But on the other hand, we have a teaching force that doesn't come from the top levels of, of our academic institutions and structures and is not prepared in a way that respects the academic complexity of the act. And that's an enormous contradiction. Yeah. 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 Well, fortunately, uh, institutions like NYU will be able to solve those issues. <laughs> oh, no doubt. No doubt. In a week, week or so, we'll get it all figured out. Okay. I mean, I know we've had some problems, you know. And there, there have been some bad moments, right? But we're on it. Mike, Good. we're on it. Oh, right Good. Good to hear that. Yeah. John, yeah. It, is always a, it is always a great treat. Um, okay. so, yeah, it was really fun. Thank Thanks. you, thank you me, so let, much. Let me know if you need me to run my mouth further. I, as Susan could tell you, I'm always willing to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. I may do uh, that. Thanks again. Okay.